Jet and the Glitter Rockets the Rugby World Cup to Parkland. First big search, Frank Searle, the man who photographed the Loch Ness Monster. Where are you? The Highlands of Scotland. Beneath these dark waters lie one of the world's greatest mysteries, the Loch Ness Monster. In the early 1970s, a series of remarkable photographs hit the world's press. They were the best evidence yet that the monster existed. They were all taken by one man, Frank Searle. He took more pictures of the monster than any other living person. But his methods made him enemies. I'm very happy to call Frank Searle a liar, a plagiarizer and um, a defamer. The actual scientific contribution that he made himself uh, is, I would say, nil. And overall, he would have probably been better off if he'd not come here at all. His private life provoked rumour and controversy. Well, Frank said, I had these girl Fridays, and I walked up to her and I said, have you ever seen the monster? And her reaction to that was, <laughs> just looked at me and said, the only monster I've seen around here is Frank Searle. In 1984, amidst a background of violence, intimidation and jealous rivalry, Frank Searle disappeared. He did rock a few boats and he upset a few people over the other side of the loch. And it's not unheard of for somebody to just vanish. And <laughs> if he vanished in here, who'd ever know? Who'd ever know? What happened to monster hunter Frank Searle? Twenty-one years after his disappearance, I travelled to Loch Ness to discover more about the man behind the famous monster photographs. Who was Frank Searle? What drove him to devote 14 years of his life to the monster? And why had he disappeared? I came across Steve Feltham, the only full-time monster hunter left at the loch. He has been here since the early 1990s. It is a boy's own adventure. In this little country where every square inch is labelled and owned by somebody, it's all mapped, it's all controlled, totally understood. 23 miles out here, where we don't know what these things are that are swimming about in there. And so to be able to drive up the M5, M6 and up the A9 and get here and get involved in a world-renowned mystery and adventure, why isn't there a I mean, mobile library van with a monster hunt hunter in it every mile around this loch side? I don't know. Steve Feltham's lone vigil is a world away from the heyday of the 1960s. Back then, a group of scientists and enthusiastic amateurs had been drawn to the loch and established the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau, the LNIB. Dick Rayner was a 17-year-old volunteer. It was very exciting to actually arrive there and uh, we found a, a group of caravans with a, a rather interesting group of people. Um, war heroes, students, draft dodgers, they were all there. And we lived in a sort of small communal lifestyle, I suppose. It was the mid-60s and it was everything that one would have hoped for, really. There was a sense of adventure among the people who were looking for evidence for strange creatures in the lock. We had to get up early in the morning before dawn, then take one of the old camera vehicles out to the appointed location somewhere around the lock then just settled down for the day's watching. The spirit was there. Everyone who turned up at the camp felt that they could be the ones to take the film the very next day that would solve the mystery. But across the loch in June 1969, a new hunter appeared. Far away from the investigation bureau, Frank Searle set up camp. Armed with only a tent, a fishing rod and a camera, he instantly stood out. 
Frank was certainly no happy. Um, he may have been what you would call a dropout, a, a dropout from society, but he was no down and out. And he enjoyed people's company, he enjoyed a laugh, and he enjoyed a joke. He was a typical East London, really, you know. I can remember Frank saying that he used to manage a fruit and vegetable shop in London. He was wounded, I know that, because he had an army pension. Um, but where he'd been wounded or what he'd done, he never said. He kept that kind of towards himself. Frank was a brash Londoner, ex-military, uh, took himself very seriously. And I remember he'd, he'd always have this camera with him that he'd stand holding with a big lens on the front of the thing. And he'd talk about, we get the RAF jets shoot up and down the loch. They still do it to this day. And he'd stand there and he'd say, see these planes? I can freeze these with my camera just like that. It's like a gun to me because I'm trained to do this with this gun of a camera. I can capture those. And that's why he thought he could photograph Nessie because he was that quick reflexes from his military training. I don't know, it was just when I was hearing someone said he was in the paratroopers, others said he was in SES. It was just different. He didn't speak of his background at all, did he, Arla? Not really. To the locals, Frank seemed a mystery man. And I remember his, his little camp at the oars. It was very cosy, really, in the, in the tent. Very cosy. Oh, I don't remember that. He had a all. carpet on the floor. Oh, my God. On the ground. There's never been anybody else that's done what I do, except for Frank Searle. I know how hard it can get living in a caravan on the side of this loch, how windy it can get, how cold it can get. I've seen minus 17 here. Frank's seen minus 17 as well, but he's been in a I mean, tent. What's down here? This is the old campsite. Jimmy Where Cameron has fished the loch for over 50 way. years. He took me to the spot where Frank Searle was first sighted back in 1969. Now, this is where he had his camp here, right here. This tree wasn't <laughs> so large then, and it, there was a bigger space. He used to come down here, and he used to sit just about this spot here, looking out onto the loch, and he spent all day there. He was looking for the monster. These posts, that you see here, these were put in by Frank when he made his jetty. That is all that's left of Frank after 35 years. Frank watched the loch for the next three years, keeping his distance from the other hunters. He reported numerous sightings of the monster, but he failed to capture anything on film. On the opposite shore, it took Dick Rayner only 10 days before he achieved a major breakthrough for the Investigation Bureau. Around midday on the, on the 10th day, I was sitting on top of the camera vehicle and uh, the water was flat calm uh, and just suddenly I, I saw this silver line coming out of Dawes Bay about a mile away across the other side of the lock. And this thing was uh, coming towards, uh, coming along the lock. At that point, I started filming. The object proceeded along, parallel to the shore, as far as I could see. And during the second part of the film, the, the pleasure cruiser, Scott 2, comes into view. Uh, it, it is only about half a mile away, compared with the distance to the object, which is about one mile away. At that point, I thought I'd filmed the Loch Ness Monster. Uh, frankly, I thought I was going to get into trouble for filming it, because it wasn't very big. Rayner's film intensified the hunt for the monster. With 23 miles of water to search, the Investigation Bureau decided to approach Frank Searle with an offer. If they lent him a camera with a telephoto lens, he would share with them any images he obtained to prove they were genuine. On the 1st of September, 1972, Frank Searle got what he'd been waiting for. A startling picture appeared in the nation's papers. It was the closest glimpse of the Loch Ness Monster ever seen. Within two months, he had a second photograph published. 
but Frank had reneged on his deal with the Investigation Bureau. He'd taken his images straight to the press. Whilst questions were asked in monster hunting circles, the pictures caused a public sensation. This was just the beginning of Frank Searle's extraordinary rise to fame. <laughs>